Hello, and welcome back to Sleepless Tales. Today we're continuing on Demian, particularly Chapter 5, or Part 5, The Bird Struggles Out of the Egg, or, as you may read, Part V, because it's in Roman numerals. We're about halfway through the book. Um, things are going great. I hope things are going great for you. I said probably in the previous video, oh, my life's so sad, but suddenly... Now it's fine again, so we'll see if I complain about it at the end. So keep you keep you on your toes, you know. Anyways, this is Sleepless Tales as always. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and favorite. And can you even favorite on YouTube anymore? Leave a comment. Tell you what, leave a comment. And let's get started with the reading. Chapter five: The bird struggles out of the egg. My painted dream bird was on its way in search of my friend. In what seemed a miraculous fashion, the reply had reached me. I was in the classroom during the break between two lessons, and on my desk I found a piece of paper tucked in my book. It was folded in the customary way we had for the notes we wrote each other during class. My sole surprise was as to who could be sending me a note of that kind, for I was not on the sort of relationship with any of my schoolfellows. I thought it would turn out to be an invitation to take part in some school rag in which I would refuse to be involved, and I placed the paper, unread, in front of my book. It was not until the lesson had started that the note found its way back into my hand. I fidgeted with the paper, unfolded it casually, and saw that it contained a few words. I glanced at them. The phrase pulled me up short. I panicked and read on. My heart contracted in cold fear before my fate. The bird is struggling out of the egg. It read, The egg is the world. Whoever wants to be born must first destroy a world. The bird is flying to God. The name of that God is called Abraxas. After reading over these lines several times, I sank into a deep reverie. There was no room for any doubt. It was Demian's reply. No one except he and I knew about the bird. My picture had reached him. He had understood and was endeavoring to enlighten me. But what was the connection? And this, what troubled me most, what was this Abraxas? I'd never heard or read the word. The name of the god is called Abraxas. The lesson passed by without my taking in a word of it. And the next began, the last in the afternoon. It was taken by a young assistant master who had just come down from the university. We liked him because he was so young and did not assume any false dignity when dealing with us. We were doing Herodotus under this Dr. Fullan's guidance. This reading period was one of the few items in the curriculum that interested me. But on this occasion, I was far away. I had opened my book mechanically in front of me, but was not following the translation. I was deeply immersed in my own thoughts, and furthermore, I had on several occasions tested the correctness of Demian's remark made to me during a scripture lesson in the old days, and if you wanted something strongly enough, you achieved it. Thus, when I was very preoccupied with my own thoughts during a lesson, I could be quite quiet, and the master would leave me undisturbed. True, if you weren't attentive or sleepy, you would suddenly find him standing by you, and that happened to me regularly. But, if you were really thinking, really absorbed, you were protected. I'd also experimented with the staring out technique and had found it effective. In Demian's time, I had not pulled it off, but now I realized that one could bring about a great deal just by thinking and intensive staring. So, I was sitting now miles away from Hereditus and school, and when the master's voice made a sudden impact on my consciousness, it felt like a thunderbolt and I woke up in a panic. I could already hear his voice. He stood close to me. I thought he had just called my name, but he did not look at me, and I breathed again. Then I heard his voice again. I heard it saying loudly the word Abraxas. In the course of an explanation, the beginning of which had escaped me, Dr. Fullen continued, we must not imagine the views of these sects and mystical societies of antiquity to be as ingenious as they at first sight appear from the rational consideration. Science, as we know, is completely unknown to antiquity. 
They compensated for this by their preoccupation with philosophical and mystical truths, which were very highly developed. From this arose a kind of black magic that often led to error and crime. But this magic had also noble antecedents and was based on a certain profundity of thought. The teaching of Abraxas, for example, which I cited to you a moment ago. This name was mentioned in connection with the magic Greek formula, and it was often considered to be the name of some evil spirit of the kind that some uncivilized tribes still believe in today. It appears, however, that Abraxas has a much deeper significance. We can therefore think of the name as one of a godhead who symbolizes the reconciliation of the godly and the satanic. The learned little man spoke with eagerness and intelligence, but no one was very attentive, and as the name did not recur in the text, my attention wandered off to my own affairs. Reconcile the godly and the satanic. The words provoked an echo inside me. I remembered the connection. The idea had been mentioned to me by Demon in the course of a conversation with him during the last days of our friendship. On that occasion, Demian had said that we had indeed a god whom we honored, but he represented only one half of the world purposely separated. That is to say, the official, authorized world of light. But we ought to be able to honor the whole world, and so we must have either one god who was also devil, or side by side with the cult of God, we should institute a cult of the devil. So, we had Abraxas, the god who was both god and devil. For a time, I eagerly pursued this clue without, however, getting any further. I unsuccessfully ransacked a whole library for references to Abraxas, but I could never be more than half-hearted in this kind of direct, conscious research, in which one can only find truths that are so much dead weight. The form of Beatrice, which had so earnestly preoccupied me for some time, was gradually becoming submerged, or was slowly drifting away from me moving further and further away towards the horizon, becoming paler, more shadowy and remote. It no longer satisfied my inner being. A new image now began to take shape in the strange, withdrawn existence which I was leading, like a sleepwalker. The longing for life began to blossom out of me. The longing for love deepened, and the sex urge which I had been able to sublimate for a time in my adoration of Beatrice now demanded a new set of images and new objectives. But these wishes remained unfulfilled, and it became more impossible than ever for me to modify this longing and expect anything from the girls among whom my friends sought their happiness. I dreamed vividly again, and more in fact in daytime than at night. Fancies and images or desires rose up before me and drew me away from the exterior world so that I had more substantial and active dealings with those fancies, dreams, and shadows, and dwelt among them more than in the world of reality around me. One definite dream or fantasy which kept recurring struck me as particularly significant. This dream, the most important and enduring of my life, followed this pattern. I was on my way to my parents' home, and over the main entrance, the heraldic bird gleamed gold on an azure ground. My mother walked towards me, but when I entered, she was about to kiss me. It was no longer she, but it took a form I had never set my eyes on, tall and strong, with a look of Max Demian, and my painted portrait, yet it somehow was different, and despite the robust frame, very feminine. The form drew me to itself and enveloped me in a deep, shuddering embrace. My feelings were a mixture of ecstasy and horror. The embrace was at once an act of worship and a crime. The form that embraced me had something about it of both my mother and my friend Demian, and also this embrace violated every sense of religious awe, yet it was bliss. Sometimes I awoke out of this dream with a feeling of ecstasy, sometimes in mortal fear and with a tortured conscience, as if I had committed some terrible sin. Only gradually and unconsciously was a link being forged between this holy inner image and the sign that came to me from outside concerning the God I had to search for. The link then grew closer and more intimate. And I began to feel that in this dream of longing, I was invoking 
Abraxas himself. Ecstasy and horror, a mixture of male and female, an intertwining of the sacred and profane. Flashes of profound guilt and the most tender innocence. Such was the nature of my love fantasy. Such was Abraxas. Love had ceased to be the dark animal urge I had first experienced with misgiving, nor was it the piously spiritualized cult I had brought to the image of Beatrice. It was both, and a good deal more besides. It was the image of angels and the devil, man and woman, human being and beast, highest good and the worst evil. It seemed that I was ordained to live in this fashion, that this was my fate. My craving for it was not untinged with fear, but there was no escape. It hovered over me continually. Next spring, I was to leave school and proceed with more advanced studies, but I was still undecided as to where and what I was to study. A faint down had appeared on my upper lip. I was a grown man, and yet completely helpless and without purpose. Only one thing persisted, my inner voice, the dream image. I felt it was my duty to follow blindly wherever this vision might lead me. But it was not easy, and every day I rejected it afresh. Perhaps as often, I was mad. Perhaps merely different from other men. But I too could do what others did. With a little effort and industry, I could read Plato, solve problems of trigonometry, or understand chemical analysis. There was only one thing I could not do, arrest from myself the darkly hidden goal and obtain some sort of picture, as others did who knew exactly what they wanted to become, teachers, judges, doctors, or artists, of how long the process would take and what hope such a future could hold out. But this I could not do. Perhaps it would be possible one day, but could I feel assured of that? Perhaps I should have to seek continually for years and then become nothing. I'd attain some goal, but it would be an evil, dangerous, and fearful one. All I wanted was to try and realize whatever was in me. Why was this so difficult? I made frequent attempts to paint the forceful dream apparition, but always without success. If I had been successful, I would have sent the picture to Demian. Where was he? I did not know. I only knew that our fates were bound up together. When would I see him again? The pleasant tranquility of the weeks and months of the Beatrice period had long receded. At that time, I had thought I had reached an island and found peace at last. But it was always like that. Practically no situation seemed agreeable. I had no sooner cheered by a dream than it immediately faded. It was no use moaning for it. And I had within me a furnace of unsatisfied cravings, a tense expectancy which often made me completely wild and mad. I often saw the dream apparition before me, miraculously clear, clearer than my own hand, and spoke with it, wept before it, and cursed it. I called it mother and knelt before it in tears. I called it devil and whore, vampire and murderer. It enticed me into the gentlest dreams of love and barren shamelessness. Nothing was too good and precious. Nothing too wicked or vile. I passed the whole of that winter in a state of inner turbulence, which I find difficult to describe. I had been long accustomed to loneliness. It did not oppress me, for I was living with Demian, with the Sparrowhawk, with the image of the great dream forms which had both my fate and my beloved and it provided for all the needs of my life, since everything was directed towards greatness in space. It was all pointed towards Abraxas. Yet, none of these dream pictures came at my bidding. I could not summon any of them. I could not. That will give any one of them its colors. It was they who took me. I was governed and lived by them. I was well armed against the outside world, I had no fear of men. I had learned that lesson from my schoolfellows, who treated me with a secret respect, which often brought a smile to my lips. When I so desired, I could see very clearly through most of them, and astonish them on occasion. But seldom, if ever, did I wish to do so. 
I was solely and exclusively preoccupied with my inner self. I wanted to live for a while longer in order to give something of myself to the world, to grapple and do battle with it. Many a time, when I went through the streets in the evening, my restlessness prevented me from returning home before midnight. I felt convinced that my beloved was bound to meet me, pass me at the next corner, and call to me from the nearest window. Often, it all seemed unendurable, and I resolved to put an end to my life. Just then, I found a strange refuge. By chance, as they say, though I believe there's no such thing. When a person urgently needs something and finds what he requires, it is not chance that gives him it. It is himself, his own craving and urgency, that brings it to him. On two or three occasions, then, during my walk through the town, I had heard an organ in a small church in the suburbs without stopping to listen. The next time I was passing, I heard it again and recognized that it was Bach. I approached the church door, which I found to be locked, and as the street was almost deserted, I sat down by the church on a curbstone. I turned up my coat collar and listened. It was a small but good organ, and it was being marvelously played with a peculiar and extremely individual expressiveness of will and determination, which gave the impression of a prayer. The player, I thought, knows that a treasure is hidden in this music. He woos it, knocks at his door, wrestles for this treasure, as he would for his life. My knowledge of music is very limited, technically, but from childhood onwards, I've had an intuitive grasp of such music of the soul and experienced it as something inevitable. The organist played something more modern afterwards. It might have been by Max Reger. The church was completely dark. Only a very thin gleam of light penetrated the nearest window. I waited until the music had stopped and strolled up and down until I saw the organist emerge. He was still quite young, but older than I was, short and squat, and he moved off quickly with an energetic yet somehow reluctant stride. On many occasions after that, I sat down by the church or walked up and down outside at the evening hour and once found the door open and sat for half an hour in a pew, frozen yet contented, while the organist above my head played in the dim gaslight. It was not the music he was playing that I heard, but himself. There seemed to be a relationship and secret connection between all the things that he played. Everything was devotional, consecrated and devout, but not devout after the manner of churchgoers and pastors are, but devout like the pilgrims, and mendicants in the Middle Ages, devout with that careless surrender to a feeling of universality, which transcends all knowledge. The organist gave renderings of the masters who preceded Bach and of old Italian masters. They all said the same thing. They all expressed what the musician had in his soul, longing, in her understanding of the world, and at the same time, the wildest separation from it. A burning hearkening into the deep places of the soul. Intoxication of religious devotion and deep curiosity of the miraculous. Once, when I followed the organist unobserved on his way out of the church, I saw him enter a small tavern at the outskirts of the town. I could not resist the urge to go in after him. Now, for the first time, I had a clear view of him. He was sitting at the host's table in a corner of the parlor, a black felt hat on his head, a glass of wine in front of him, and his face was just what I had anticipated. He was ugly, somewhat wild-looking, interrogative and erratic, wayward and obstinate, yet the mouth had something soft and childish about it. All the masculinity and strength was in the eyes and brow. The lower half of his face was tender and immature, indecisive and to some extent feminine, The chin, irresolute, boy-like, contradicted the forehead and expression. What I liked were the dark brown eyes full of pride and hostility. I sat down opposite to him without a word. There was nobody else in the inn. He flashed a glance at me, as if he wanted to get rid of me. But I held it and stared back, unmoved, until he shouted in a peevish tone, Why are you looking at me so devilishly hard? Do you want something out of me? No, I don't want anything from you, I replied, but I have already had a good deal. He knitted his brows. 
Mm, so you're a music enthusiast. I know it's revolting to be mad about music. But I refuse to be intimidated. I've often found you in your church over there, I said. But I won't inopportune you further. I thought I should perhaps discover something about you. Something special. I don't really know what. But perhaps you'd rather not listen to me. I can always listen to you in church. But I always lock it. Just recently forgot to. And I sat inside. Otherwise, I stand outside or sit on the curb. Oh, another time you may come in. It's warmer. All I've got to do is knock at the door, but bang hard, and not while I'm playing. But fire ahead, what do you want to tell me? You're a young fellow, and probably a schoolboy or university student. Are you a musician? No. I like listening, but only to the kind of music you play. Pure music. The music that makes you feel what someone is shaking in heaven and hell. I'm fond of music. I think because it is so amoral. Everything else is moral, and I'm after something that isn't. I have often found moralizing intolerable. I don't know how to put it. Do you realize that there must be a God who is both God and devil? There's supposed to be one. I've heard about it. The musician pushed his hat back on his head and tossed his hair back away from his lofty forehead. At the same time, he gave me a piercing glance and nodded to me across the table. In a gentle, eager voice, he asked, What's the name of the god of whom you speak? Unfortunately, I know practically nothing about him except his name, which is Abraxas. The musician gave a vaguely mistrustful glance round him, as though someone might be spying on us. Then he bent over to me and whispered, I thought as much. Who are you? I'm a pupil at the grammar school. How do you know about Abraxas? Just by chance. He struck the table so that the wine spilled out of his glass. Chance! Don't talk rubbish, young fellow. One doesn't get to know about Abraxas by chance. Mark my words. I'll tell you more about him. I know a little. He fell silent and pushed his hair back. When I looked expectantly at him, he pulled a face. Not here. Some other time. Here, take some. And in so saying, he dealt into the pocket of his overcoat, which he had not removed, and pulled at a handful of roast chestnuts, which he threw over to me. And I said nothing, and took them and ate them, and felt very happy. Well, he whispered after a while, how do you know about him? I did not hesitate to tell him. I was alone and desperate at the same time, I said. Then, the friend of my earlier days intervened, <laughs> who knows, I think, a, I think a good deal about him. I had painted something, a bird emerging from a terrestrial globe, which I sent to him. Some time later, when I had really forgotten about it, I received a slip of paper on which this was written. The bird is struggling out of the egg. The egg is the world. Whoever wants to be born must destroy a world. The bird is flying to God, and the name of the God is called Abraxas. He did not reply. We shelled our chestnuts and ate them with the wine. What about another glass? He asked. No, thank you. I'm not keen on drinking. He gave a very disappointed laugh. As you will. It's quite the reverse with me. I'll stay here, but you go along now. The next time I went with them after the organ music, he was not very communicative. He led me down an old lane and up the stairs of a stately old house into a large, somewhat gloomy, and neglected room, where apart from the piano, there was nothing to suggest music. On the other hand, a large bookcase and a writing desk gave the room a studious look. What a quantity of books you have, I remarked as I took them in. And part of them come from my father's library. I live with them, yes. I reside with my father and mother, but I cannot introduce you to them, because my acquaintances are not greatly respected in this house. I am a prodigal son, you know. My father is terribly respectable, an important pastor and preacher in this town. For your information, 
I must tell you, I am his talented and promising son who has gone astray, and to some extent even mad. I was a theology student and left that honorable faculty shortly before the state examination. Though, I still retain my interest in the subject as far as my private studies are concerned. What sort of gods people devised for themselves in the old days I still consider an important and fascinating study. Furthermore, I'm a musician now, and I'm surely to obtain some insignificant appointment as an organist, so it seems. Then I shall be back in the church again. I glanced along the spines of the books, noticed Greek, Latin, and Hebrew titles as far as the feeble light from the small table lamp permitted. Meantime, my acquaintance had lain down on the floor in the darkness and appeared to be preparing for something. Come, he called out after a time. We will now practice a little philosophy. That means holding our tongues, lying on our bellies, and thinking. He struck a match and set light to the paper and wood in the fireplace, in front of which he was sprawling. The flames leapt high. He poked and fed them with exaggerated care. I lay next to him on the threadbare carpet. He stirred into the fire, which attracted me too, and we lay on our bellies a good hour in front of the flickering log fire, watching the flames dart about, sink, and curve and flicker, and finally die down in quiet sunken glow beneath the hearth. Fire worship was by no means the most stupid invention, he muttered once to himself. Apart from this, neither of us said a word. I stared hard into the fire and sank into a tranquil reverie, saw shapes in the smoke and pictures in the ashes. My companion was throwing a piece of rosin into the red-hot embers. A small, slender flame shut up, and I saw in it the bird with the yellow sparrow hawk's head. In the dying embers, threads of gold wove nets, letters of the alphabet and pictures appeared. Hints of faces, animals, plant forms, worms and snakes. When I awoke from my reverie and looked at my friend, he was gazing with fanatical concentration into the ashes, his chin resting on his fists. I must go now, I murmured. Go then. Goodbye. He did not rise to his feet. And as the lamp was out, I had to grope my way out of the cursed old house through dark rooms and corridors. I stopped in the street and looked up at the old house. There was no light burning in any one of those windows. A small brass plate on the front door gleamed in the light from the gas lamp. On it, I read the words, Pistorius Rector. Not until I got home and was sitting alone in my little room after supper did it occur to me that I had heard nothing about either Abraxas or Pistorius, and that we had scarcely exchanged half a dozen words. But I was very satisfied with my visit. And for our next meeting, he had promised to play me an exquisite piece of ancient organ music, a Passacaglia, by Bukestiud. Without realizing it, the organist, Pistorius, had given me my first lesson when I had lain beside him in front of the fire on the floor in his hermit's room. Staring into the fire had done me good. It had strengthened and confirmed the certain predispositions which I had always possessed but never cultivated. Gradually, I was beginning to understand them. Even as a child, I had had intervals of fondness for observing strange forms in nature. Not so much examining them as surrendering myself to their magic, their oblique message. Long tree roots, colored veins in rock, patches of oil floating on water, flaws in glass, all such things had a certain fascination for me. Above all, water and fire, smoke, clouds, dust, and especially the swirling specks of color which swam before my closed eyes. In the days following my first visit to Pistorius, I began to call all this to mind, for I noticed that I owed a new strength and gaiety, an intensification of feeling, of which I only became aware later, exclusively to this prolonged staring into the fire. I found it remarkably comforting and rewarding. To the few experiences which I had so far discovered on my road to my goal, it was now added to this one. The consideration of such images as I have mentioned, 
the surrender to odd, irrational forms in nature, produces in us a sense of the harmony of our inner being with the will which has been responsible for these shapes. Soon, we became aware of the temptation to think of them as being our own moods, our own creations. We see the boundaries between ourselves and nature quiver and dissolve and we become acquainted with the state of mind when we are unable to decide whether the liniments of our body result from impressions received from outside or from within us. In no other practice is it so simple to discover how creative we are and to what extent our souls participate in the continuous creation of the world. To an even greater extent, it is in this same indivisible divinity which is active in us and in nature, so that if the outer world were destroyed, each one of us would be capable of building it up again. For mountain and stream, tree and leaf, root and blossom, every form in nature is echoed in us and originates in the soul, whose being is eternity and is hidden from us, but nonetheless gives itself to us for the most part in the power of love and creation. It was not until many years later that I found this view recorded in a book by Leonardo da Vinci, who on one occasion describes how good and deeply moving it is to look at a wall which many people have spat upon. Confronted with each stain on the wet wall, he must have felt the same as Pistorius and I did in front of that fire. At our next meeting, the organist offered an explanation. We always said, two narrow limits on our personalities. We count as ours merely what we experience differently as individuals or recognize as being divergent. Yet, we consist of the whole existence of the world, each one of us, and just as our body bears in it the various stages of evolution back to the fish and further back still, we have in our soul everything that has ever existed in the human mind. All the gods and devils, whether among the Greeks, Chinese, Zulus, they're, they're all within us, existing as possibilities, wishes, outlets. If the human race dwindled to one single half-developed child that had received no education, this child would rediscover the entire course of evolution, it would be able to produce gods, devils, paradise, commandments and interdictions, the whole of the Old and New Testament, everything. It's all very well, I interpolated. But what then is the value of the individual? Why do we still struggle on if everything is already complete within us? Stop, cried Pistorius peremptorily. There's a great deal of difference between bearing the world within you and being conscious of that piece of knowledge. A madman can produce thoughts that are an echo of Plato and a pious young schoolboy in a theological college ponders on profound mythological connections which occur in the Gnost or Zoroaster. But he knows nothing of it. While he remains ignorant, he is a tree or a stone, at best an animal. Once, however, he has the firm glimmering of this knowledge, he becomes a man. And certainly, you don't think of all the bipeds who walk among the streets as human beings, merely because they walk upright and carry their young nine months. You can see how many of them are fish or sheep, worms or angels, and how many are ants, how many are bees. Human potentialities are present in each one of them, but only when he realizes them and learns to make them to some extent a conscious part of him can the individual be said to possess them. Such was the general tenor of our conversation together. Rarely did they teach me anything completely new, or bring me any overwhelming surprises. They all, however, even the most banal, struck a gentle but continuous hammer blow on the same spot inside me. They helped shape me, to peel off my layers of skin and break the eggshells. And as I emerged from each stage, I raised my head a little higher with a greater feeling of freedom until my yellow bird pushed his handsome predatory head out of the shattered shell of the terrestrial globe. We frequently recounted our dreams to each other, and Pistorius was able to provide an interpretation. I even recall one remarkable example. I had a dream in which I was able to fly, yet only in such a manner that I was somehow flung into the air, and yet had no mastery over it. The sensation of this flight was exhilarating, but it 
soon turned into fear when I saw myself powerless and flung to a considerable height. I then made the comforting discovery that I could regulate my rise and fall by holding or releasing my breath. Vistorius explained it to me. The impetus which enables you to fly is our great human possession. Everybody has it. It is the feeling of the connection one has with every source of power. But it is frightening. It's devilishly dangerous. That is why the majority of people are so willing to renounce any idea of flying and prefer to stroll quietly among the pavement and obey the law. But you're not one of these. You have higher aspirations, as behoves a man of spirit. And look, you discover the miracle that you are gradually winning the mastery and that to the great common power which sweeps you upward is added a fine, subtle power, a machine, a means of steering a course. And it's wonderful. Without it, you would drift about in the air, powerless. That is what madmen do. They have deeper presentiments than the people on the pavement, but they have no key and no helm to steer with, and they whirl around in the abyss. But you, Sinclair, you do things. And how is that? You don't really know, do you? You do it with a new organ, a breath controller. That shows you how impersonal your soul is down in its depths. It is unaware of this regulator, but it isn't new. It is alone. It has existed for thousands of years. It is the fish's sense of equilibrium, the air bladder. And in point of the fact, there are a few strange and primeval genera of fish in which the air bladder is a kind of lung and can function on occasion in that capacity. It closely resembles the lung you use for flying in your dreams. He brought along a volume of zoology for me to study and showed me the names and illustrations of these ancient fish. And with a peculiar shudder, I felt conscious of a function that existed in me from earlier stages of evolution. And that was the entirety of chapter five. The bird struggles out of the egg. I was almost said the egg bird struggle bird, but as you can see, guys, I struggle to speak sometimes. Whenever I do these for too long, and this was a pretty long part, I really start just having to do retakes every ten seconds, and it's quite a challenge. Um, this is Sleepless Tales, as always. I hope you're enjoying the reading of Max Demian, or just Demian, or Sinclair, whatever it's renamed to. What's this book called? By uh, Herman Hees. I was looking up um, other books by Herman Hees to read through, but they are none of them are open domains, so I can't read them. Sorry. They're, well, there's a couple, but they all suck, and I don't want to do them. So, shall we? Anyways, Sleepless Tales. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next part. Have a great night.